On Friday, we, we took an unusual text for a good Friday morning. And we took it from Luke chapter 24, from the story of the disciples on the Emmaus Road, which is very much an Easter Sunday story. But we, that's where we found our text. And we go back there this morning, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, it's a fairly familiar story, the story of the Emmaus Road. Two disciples had left Jerusalem in the kind of despair that was overtaking them. It had been reported that the tomb was empty. And some were saying that Jesus had risen, but some were completely unconvinced. And the disciples on the Emmaus Road were in a state of real despair. There's no other way to put it. They were in a state of real despair. And they were talking to themselves, and as they talked, Jesus came alongside them. The Bible says that they didn't recognise him, but he came alongside them. And as he listened to their conversation, verse 17, Luke 24, he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? Well, from our side of the story, what a stupid question. <laughs> but that was, such was their despair. Such was their despair. And he said to them, What things? As if he didn't know. And they said to him the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping. There's their despair. We were hoping. We were hoping. The Bible makes it clear that there were a lot more than 12 disciples. We talk a lot about the 12. But there were 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And when they went to elect a successor to Judas, the criterion for electing the criteria for electing the successor to Judas was that they had been with Jesus from the beginning. And there were candidates who had been with Jesus from the beginning and who were clearly not part of the twelve. It was quite an entourage that moved around with Jesus. And there's a distinct chance that these two men had been with Jesus for a very long time. They'd sat at his feet. They'd listened to all he had to say. They had most probably had private conversations with him about a whole range of things. But when a push came to shove, when Jesus was hung on the cross and when the tomb was empty and they had no idea what had happened to him, all they can say is, we were hoping. Hope shattered. Hope shattered. We were hoping. We thought we'd found the Messiah. We were hoping that he was the real one. We were hoping. But it's three days since all of this happened. Yes, and some of the women arrived at the tomb. His body was gone. Yes, they didn't see him. What despair. And yet they were in the presence of the risen Lord. Oh, the Kahito. Prompted by the Holy Spirit to say this morning that I suspect that there are some people in this meeting this morning in the presence of the living God, and yet there's still a sense of despair in your life. Today's the day to put it right with him and meet him because their despair is about to change. It's about to change big time. And it changed big time because their eyes were opened and they realised who he was. And if your eyes were to be opened this morning for you to realise who exactly he is, that burden on your heart, that despair in your spirit, can be turned from death to life today. You believe that? Say amen this morning. Verse 25, And he said to them, O foolish ones, 
and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things? If you'd only spent some time in the Scriptures, if you'd only listened to me when I was sitting and talking with you, when you were sitting at my feet, if you'd only listened to me, you would know that the Christ had to suffer. You would have known these things. Indeed, Jerusalem was filled with people who knew these things. Jerusalem was the spiritual heart of the nation and the most powerful and the most intelligent scholars of Jewish history and Jewish scripture were present in that city and they missed, as Jesus said, they missed the day of their visitation because they could not equate the scriptures to what was actually happening even though what was happening was exactly what the scriptures said would happen. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, and I said on Friday morning, I'll say it again, <laughs> I would love to have been a fly on the wall to hear Jesus take us back to Moses and bring us through the prophets and point out the things concerning himself. Oh, I've given it a shot every now and then. <laughs> but I ought to have heard the Master make it really clear. Wouldn't have that been something? Beginning at all the prophets, Moses and all the prophets, and then the Bible goes on to say their eyes were open. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter his glory? There's a very real sense that on Good Friday we think of the Christ suffering these things and today we think of the Christ entering his glory because that's exactly what happened. Risen from the dead. He is risen. He's risen indeed. He's the King of kings, the Lord of glory. The tomb is empty. When you go to Jerusalem and do a tour of the holy city, they don't take you to a sealed up tomb. They show you an empty tomb. Whether or not it's the real one's another story, but the reality is it is empty. It is empty. He is not here. He is risen. He is not here. He is risen. Some of you will know that if I have a favourite book in the Bible, it's the book of Romans. And I love, I absolutely love the opening verses of this book. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, of Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Now you and I, more often than not, talk about the gospel of Jesus. But Paul in Romans very specifically and very accurately refers to the gospel of God. The gospel was conceived in the heart of the Father before time began. Paul tells us in Ephesians that in the predetermined counsel and foreknowledge of God, he put into place a plan that should there be a failure at creation, there would be a plan of redemption. Hallelujah. He put it in place. The Bible says he knew what was in the heart of man. And Paul calls it the gospel of God. It's not the gospel of Jesus. Oh, he's the central figure. There's no two ways about that. But it's the gospel that was born in the heart of the Father in eternity past. That you and I, sinners that we are, prone to wander, as the songwriter said, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the one I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. You and I, who are so prone who have a natural bent, not to goodness, but to evil. Are sinners who need a saviour. And Jesus is the only saviour. And the plan that he would send forth his son, born of a woman, was conceived in eternity past. That you and I might be born as we've sung this morning, into the family of God and be children of the living God. I'm a child of God. I am a child of God. Paul goes on to say this gospel, 
of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. How? By the resurrection from the dead. What the resurrection does is make a definitive statement about Jesus. I don't know whether you've ever thought of it like this, but the resurrection makes a definitive statement about Jesus. And that definitive statement is, he is the Son of God. He is the Son of God. That is the definitive statement. Declared to be the Son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead. Oh, I've got no doubt that Buddha was a good man, but he wasn't risen from the dead. I'm not so sure about Muhammad, but some people think he was a good man. But he's not risen from the dead. And one could go on and mention hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, but I know one who was declared to be the Son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ. My Bible tells me that he was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. That plan conceived in eternity past. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, my Bible tells me this. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that tells me that there's a prospect that he can or that he doesn't. Is that right? If, and he does, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, he shall quicken your mortal body or bring your body to life. He will be the life force within you, giving you energy and spiritual life. But if, and he's not, then you don't have life in God. And the alternative to life in God is not an alternative that I want to contemplate. I was in three this week. I don't know if others saw it on the web, but checking my email and as those wretched ads come up, as they do, you know, that you've got no control about it because you're a pauper who doesn't want to pay for the free one without the ad. Um, that's most of us, isn't it? <laughs> we, we don't pay the extra bit. We put up with the ads. But up came an ad for a news story. The Pope says there is no hell. What a lie. The Pope says there is no hell. Now that attracted my attention. <laughs> that caused me to click, yes. as you do. <laughs> click and go. So I clicked and went. And the Pope was being interviewed by some reporter somewhere. Footnote to the story, this reporter has previously mistranslated the Pope and his translation has been wrong. <laughs> That's an interesting little footnote, isn't it? But according to this reporter, the Pope says, those who die in Christ go into his presence and those who don't die in Christ disappear forever. Well, they don't, according to my Bible. I know where they go. Footnote, this reporter has been known to mistranslate the Pope before. <laughs> don't you just love that? I think another person who is rather remarkable in our world today refers to that as fake news. But, but my Bible also tells me that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is Paul writing that great chapter on the resurrection. And he says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all 
or as some translations put it, of greatest importance. I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Oh, and that he was buried. My Bible tells me that when he was buried, he descended into hell. Have you read that somewhere? My Bible tells me that he went looking for the saints who prior to his coming had no hope. He went looking for them and set them free. And that in Jerusalem, on the day of his resurrection, there were resurrected people wandering around the place. Have you read that in the book? I've read it in the book. It's quite a good book to read. Interesting story. It's got nice little snippets like that in it from here. But he descended into hell and, according to the, the language of the old Apostles' Creed, led captivity captive and delivered them. He descended into hell, the Apostles' Creed said, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. On the third day he rose again. He rose again. In the same chapter, Paul says that he, he died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again on the third day of, uh, according to the Scriptures. He was seen by Cephas, then by the Twelve, and eventually Paul says, and last of all, he was seen by me as one born out of time. What a privilege. What a privilege. What a privilege have seen Jesus face to face as he did on the Damascus road. But in verse 20 of that same chapter, but now is Christ risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. It's not the fact that Christ died for your sins that will take you to heaven. It makes possible the prospect that if you're risen with him, you can go to heaven. Buried with him for the forgiveness of our sins, risen with him for our justification. And what does justification mean? You know the old acrostic, just as if I'd never sinned. We can't stand before God unless we are just as if we'd never sinned. It's the only way we can stand before God. So buried with him for our salvation, risen with him for our justification that we might stand in his presence. No, not standing in our, his presence as we are today, but standing in his presence, as Paul goes on to explain in this chapter, in the dynamic change that will take place in our lives, standing in his presence, in our perfected form. Perfected why? Because he's become the first fruits of them that sleep. I love the truth of Scripture. I think Scripture does a lot of things to help us set into context our pet ideas. <laughs> if we actually go to the Scriptures, we find out what's really said and we get it sorted in our mind. We go to the right place. When Peter was writing, and, and those who come to the Thursday night study know that we've been to uh, the first uh, letter of Peter in recent days and we found that to be incredibly helpful. And uh, we've learned some stuff that some of us didn't realise was there. But in First Peter, Paul uh, Peter says this about Jesus and about the salvation that comes to us in Jesus. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. What's Peter saying? Peter is saying that when the prophets prophesied about the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus, they didn't have a clue what they were writing about. That's interesting in itself. Peter is saying they inquired to try and work out what on earth it was that prompted by the Holy Spirit they were writing down. 
I find that amazing. The prophets, and there are so many verses. Oh, I wish we could spend three or four hours together and we could go through some verses. But you would walk out on me. I know you would. But uh, what, I, what I find is extraordinary is that the closer you look at some of these pro- prophecies, these prophetic words, the accuracy of the word that they give, even though Peter says they didn't know what they were writing about, but prompted by the Holy Spirit, they wrote what they were told to write. They didn't know what they were writing about, but we've just discovered what they were writing about. So Isaiah writes, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah, oh, surely Isaiah knew. 600 years before Christ, he didn't have a clue. Don't you find that amazing? He didn't have a clue. And yet Isaiah says some absolutely remarkable things. Absolutely remarkable things. Isaiah 53 verse 8. I'm sorry I'm jumping around up there, but you're doing great. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Just think about that for a minute. 600 years before Christ, Isaiah writes, not having a clue what he's writing about, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich. He was crucified between two thieves. He was laid in the grave of one of the wealthy men of his day. And 600 years, not knowing what he's writing, Isaiah says he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. How incredible. How incredible after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. In a different translation to what we've got on the screen, but that's what it says. Isn't that extraordinary? 600 years. Jesus said to the disciples on the Emmaus Road, I'm going to explain to you all the way from Moses through the prophets what on earth was going on so you really do know. And you know what happened? Paul on one occasion says in one of his letters he was writing that his readers would not be ignorant brethren. (laughs) Well, these two ignorant brethren suddenly became very learned brethren, didn't they? Very learned brethren. As Jesus expounded them all the way from Moses through the prophets, the things concerning himself. And there in the prophet he, he, he shows them a verse that says, after the suffering of his soul. He shall see the light of day and be satisfied. Beautiful verse, Psalm 110, verse 3, says, From the womb of the dawn you will receive your youth. That's a lovely phrase, isn't it? You're aware of that verse? Psalm 110, 3, From the womb of the dawn you will receive the dew of your youth. Love that. And we know the psalmist reference, Psalm 16. He says, you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see corruption. Wow. We go to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. Right towards the end of the Old Testament, second last book, in point of fact. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me, whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. Oh, Zechariah, how do you get this kind of accuracy? 
I guess you had a better show than Isaiah. You were only 500 years before Christ. 500 years before Christ. Zechariah is this specific. They will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for the firstborn. In that day there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, the mourning amongst the people of God. But go to the next chapter, chapter 13 and verse 1. But in that day, in that day, the day of their mourning, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. In that day, a fountain shall be opened in the house of David, for sin and uncleanness. Aren't you glad that a fountain's been opened in the house of David for sin and uncleanness? I don't know about you, but I need to go to that fountain all too often to get washed, don't you? You're honest enough to admit that this morning, that you need that fountain. Aren't you glad it was opened in the house of David for sin and uncleanness? Years ago, I was ministering in Canada and uh, I'd been to a camp, and uh, it was Pentecost weekend. And uh, on the Sunday night, as often happens with these camps, we went back to the home church for the Sunday evening meeting. And I was a visitor from Australia, and they wanted to show me their beautiful suite of buildings, and it was a lovely suite of buildings. And they took me down into the basement. Americans and Canadians have these amazing basements, don't they? Uh, Joe, these amazing basements. This church had this phenomenal basement. But it was noisy down there. And I said to the pastor, what's the noise? It's noisy down here. Oh, yes, when we're down here, we play music to shut, out, to shut off that, that noise. I said, what is that noise? He said, oh, it's the pump. I said, the pump for what? He said, the pump for the spring that's underneath the building. I said, oh, really? And so he went over to the corner of the, this big basement downstairs and he opened the door and, oh, the noise of this pump. I said, where's that water coming from? He said, it's the purest water in this city. I said, really? He said, oh, we've had it tested. It's the purest water in this city, but we've got to pump it down the drain. If we didn't pump it, it would flood the basement. Well, why can't you use it? The council won't let us. Does that sound familiar? It's the purest water in the city, but the council won't let us use it. And I said, so you just pump it away. And we went into the Sunday night service. I was preaching and they started singing. There is a river that flows from God above. There is a fountain that filled with God's own love. Come to the waters. There is a vast supply. Come to the river that never will run dry. And it broke me. It broke me that night. Because I remembered that there had been a fountain opened in the house of David for sin and uncleanness. The purest fountain that could ever be opened to wash away the filth of the dirtiest that ever lived. How incredible is that? And the prophet prophesied that some 500 years before Jesus. Wow. Oh, I could go on. I've got verse after verse after verse. I made reference on Friday to Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6, the same chapter. One will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? And he will answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friend. And Isaiah in chapter 63 says, I have trodden the winepress alone. I have trodden the winepress alone. Paul says, We preach Christ. who died, was crucified according to the scriptures, died on the third day according to the scriptures, was buried 
rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, died, according to the scriptures, buried, rose again on the third day, apologies for my slip up there, was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. I find the detail of scripture concerning the Saviour absolutely staggering. Absolutely staggering. There's no excuse for any believer to have any doubt into who Jesus was. There's no excuse for any believer to have any doubt as to who Jesus was. The religious authorities of Jesus' day knew exactly who he was. But if they'd acknowledged who he was, they'd do themselves out of a lifestyle to which they'd become accustomed. They loved the authority, they loved the notoriety, they loved the privileges, and they weren't going to surrender them to Jesus or to any other. And the high priest of the day said it is expedient that one should die for the people. They knew exactly who he was. They knew exactly who he was. When Peter and John, after they had had been used by God to miraculously give strength into the body of the, the man who was crippled and sitting by the gate, beautiful, when eventually they ended up before the Sanhedrin, do you know what the Sanhedrin actually said about Peter and John? It was evident that they had been with Jesus. They knew exactly who Jesus was. And I want to say to you this morning, as I say to myself, if we were students of the scripture, we would know who, exactly who Jesus is. And we would be worshipping him like there was nothing else to do. And we would be serving him like there was no reason for doing anything else. My call to you on this, this Easter day, this may be a bit more sober or something, or a bit more intellectual or something, I don't know. You're very quiet, as Neil would say in his Presbyterian church this morning. But I just want to say to you, we have every reason to be confident in who Jesus is. Absolutely every reason to be confident in who Jesus is. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he talks about the fact that we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. To, but to us who are being saved, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. To the Jews a stumbling block. Why a stumbling block? Because although they had their scriptures, they stumbled over those scriptures when the reality of who he was and what he was doing confronted them. The idea that their Messiah would go to the cross when push came to shove was something they couldn't handle. And yet the scriptures clearly said he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And like a sheep before its shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. I mean, duh. What part of that is not obvious? But they stumbled over it. They stumbled over it. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness to the intellectual Western mind, stupidity. Why would you believe that one died and was buried, who hung on a Roman cross, who was so dead that even the Romans wouldn't break his legs because he was so dead? Huh. There's a theory that some still advocate, what's called the swoon theory. They said his pain was so great that he became unconscious, but when he got into the cool of the grave, it revived him. And he was strong enough, having been revived, to push the stone away all by himself. Ugh. To the Greeks, foolishness. Foolishness. And out there today, no disrespect for my countrymen, but how many will be in church? Hundreds of thousands? How many won't be? 20-something million? Why? Because the Easter bunny is more believable than Jesus. A bunny that lays eggs. 
more believable than the one hung on a cross, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he was raised again from the dead and ascended into heaven from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I want to post my, my colours to the mast today and say I believe in Jesus. Died for my sin. Paul, when he gets towards the end of the life, having started off with a spirit of arrogance deep within him, ends up by saying, now I'm the chief of sinners. I have to put my hand up and say, Paul, well, you've got one or two mates and I'm sorry I'm one of them too. But my Bible tells me the dying thief rejoiced to see salvation in his day. And here am I, as poor as he, and he takes all my sin away. Oh! Let's stand together. We've got about three pages of ten pages of notes. Aren't you glad I didn't do the other seven? <laughs> Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus today and we declare that your Son, the Lord Jesus, has become our Saviour. We declare, as the, as the Word of God says, that we believe that by his resurrection, Jesus has been declared to be the Son of God with power. And we accept the fact that it is by the stripes of the Son of God dying on the cross of Calvary that we are saved from our sin and by his resurrection from the dead we are justified for a future life with him. We thank you, Lord, for the death and resurrection of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. We declare today that we are people who live in the light of the resurrection of Jesus. We live in the light of the resurrection of Jesus. My Bible says that if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken your mortal body. And I want to say on this, this Easter Sunday 2018 that if the spirit of God is not alive in your body today, if you are not convinced of Jesus as saviour or you are becoming convinced as this meeting goes on and you want to mark the moment, today's a good day to mark that moment. And you ought to come and stand forward, declare yourself, openly declare today. One thing that Jesus didn't do, he didn't hide. He went to the cross openly. His, his shame, his sorrow, his, his beaten and battered body, his death was on show for all the world to see. Some will mock, but for those who believe, he became their saviour. And if you would declare him today, and you do need to declare him openly, there's no such thing as secret service Christians. You need to declare him openly. And if that's you this morning, we want to love on you. We don't want to shame you. We just want to love on you this morning. I invite you to come and we will pray for you. Some of the elders and leaders of the church will gather around you and bless you in Jesus' name. And if you're a believer today and yet the Spirit of God is, has somehow become very dull in your life and you need, as Neil would say, a dose of the ghost this morning, you need to have your faith in him quickened, your faith in, in God by his Spirit quickening you today. You need the, your, the presence of the Holy Spirit to be refreshed and renewed in your life. I'm deeply encouraged by the fact that only a couple of weeks after Pentecost Sunday, the Jew, the, the disciples gathered together after persecution and stuff had broken around them. And what did they pray for? To be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit. Excuse me, they were there at Pentecost. Yes, and they needed to be filled afresh. If this morning on Resurrection Day you need to be filled afresh, you need to come as we sing. I understand we're going to sing Victor's Crown. Is that right? Let's rejoice in the King. But if you should come, you come as we rejoice.